Hey everyone, uh, welcome to AWS On Air, where we're gonna be talking about Amazon SageMaker serverless inference. I've tried saying that five times over, hasn't really worked out well for me, but I'm your host, Kyle Dickinson, and I have my co-host, Nathan, uh, and we're gonna be talking more about this serverless inference stuff with our friends today. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey everyone, my name is Rishab. I'm a senior product manager with Amazon SageMaker. Hey everyone, I'm Ram. I'm a ML architect with the SageMaker service team. Nathan, awesome. Who are thanks you? for, uh, thanks who for, who are you, Nathan? Us. Uh, my name is Nathan. I'm a developer advocate, uh, at AWS. Great. Awesome. Uh, so what is it that we're going to be talking today about Amazon SageMaker serverless inference? So Amazon SageMaker serverless inference is a new inference option we, which we launched in April this year uh, in general availability. Uh, it was launched in preview and last reInvent. Um, it, it is a new feature which makes it extremely simple for customers to deploy machine learning models in production without having to worry about any of the infrastructure management. Um, as the name suggests, uh, it's serverless, so customers do not have to provision or manage any servers. Uh, they just need to provide us um, uh, an ECR image of their inference code um, and the model artifacts, and we we will provision the underlying compute and we'll manage all of the infrastructure uh, so that customers can focus really on optimizing their ML code and do less of the infrastructure management. So my understanding is SageMaker is offering a full suite of of tooling for working with machine learning models. You know, all the way from the training. Uh, and and this, so this is focused on the inferencing model uh, stage where it's actually time to start using your model in production, maybe plugging some data in and getting some responses out. So how does this differ from the other options that are available in SageMaker? Yeah, so uh, within SageMaker, we already had few inference options. The first one was uh, real-time inference, which is focused on, um, which is basically instance-based and uh, which is focused on uh, high throughput, uh, ultra low latency use cases. Then we have batch transform, which is again something that customers use extensively for offline processing jobs. And if they want to save the data in an S3 bucket and then do post analysis. Um, we also launched uh, last year something called asynchronous inference, which is um, uh, which is more useful for, cu for customers with larger payload size, like computer vision types of workloads, uh, and also with longer processing time. So these were already there, uh, but we kept hearing from customers that um, uh, for intermittent kind of workloads, they wanted an alternatives wherein they can basically just provide us the inference code and they, they wanted less of the infrastructure management. Uh, and that's why we came up with uh, serverless inference. That's the classic story I hear over and over again. There's always more different types of workloads and that's more challenges. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you mentioned, you know, my favorite word is serverless. Um, you know, so that's telling me that there's not infrastructure running when you're not using it. Is that correct? Absolutely. So essentially the way that it works is that we, we, um, we provision compute resources, uh, based on the traffic volume and we manage all of the scaling under the hood. So customers basically, as I said, provide us the inference code and we'll spin up the compute resources as the traffic goes up, we'll uh, scale up the compute and as the traffic goes down, we'll scale it down and we'll also scale it down to zero so that the customers don't get charged during idle time, which significantly reduces their cost for intermittent kind of workloads. What, uh, so that's great and all. So when would you want to use uh, this serverless inference over the the other existing SageMaker inference that you mentioned? Now, keep in mind, I'm a, I'm a security guy by, uh, by profession. So uh, when you talk about machine learning, it blows my mind. Um, so I would think that, you know, serverless, though I want to save money, um, you know, it runs when you need it. Uh, so what are the use cases for this serverless uh, functionality? Yeah, uh, so one of the trade-offs uh, and factors that customers need to keep in mind is that with any serverless architecture, there is going to be cold start. So what happens is when you, once you send a request, we'll spin up the compute resources, we'll respond back to the request. But let's say there is no new request for a certain duration of time, we'll tear down all of that compute and then spin it back when there is another new request. So when, you, when we are spinning it back up, uh, we'll have to download the model and prepare the compute, which will 
essentially lead to a cold start. So not all workloads can tolerate the cold start. Um, certain workloads have latency threshold. Uh, in that case, it's obviously better to go with an instance-based um, real-time endpoint with SageMaker offers. But in, in cases where customers can tolerate the cold start, um, uh, which which could be like maybe a test or dev environment, it could be like um, like uh, any, any of the internal like machine learning workloads. So so all of those cases where latency is not super critical, in that case, serverless inference fits well. So so I'm definitely thinking about customers that uh, on the asynchronous part, you know, customers that that maybe spin up an application at the start of the day or like data streams in, they start processing it. What are the customers that are, that are benefiting uh, from this uh, already? Yeah, so we have a bunch of customers. We already started using the feature. Uh, uh, Bazaar Voice, for example, which is a SaaS provider, um, was earlier uh, looking for an option where wherein they wanted fast scalability, but at the same time, they uh, had workloads which were intermittent. So they wanted to reduce the cost structure um, across hundreds of clients that they had, right? Um, so they have deployed multiple models on serverless inference, and they are essentially seeing the benefits um, uh, through cost reduction and also scalability. Wow. So I feel like I, like I, I'm, I'm learning about the use cases here. I'm learning about uh, some of the trade-offs with the cold start versus the, the on-demand. I'd really like to see this in action so I can get a better sense of like how this is working. And then I'm sure I'm going to have more questions because I see it. <laughs> Ooh, I hear there's a demo. Yeah. Let's see if there's is there a demo? Like all right, let's let's Always. do a demo. All right, awesome. So feel free to interrupt me whenever. Um, if you two just want to have a quick question about any of this, if I'm For just sure. rambling on, you could always chat about all the steps. But as Rishab said, the cool part about serverless inference is not much is changing from real time inference or ASIC inference from a code perspective. If you already have experience with SageMaker, the two main artifacts that you really provide for serverless inference are your model data. So if you have a trained model that you worked with, so for sklearn, this might be a job lib or a pickle file, or um, for PyTorch, it might be your .pt file. You just provide that model data and S3 location and the corresponding image. And what I mean by image is that everything in SageMaker is containerized. Either we provide those existing images for popular frameworks like scikit-learn, TensorFlow, and PyTorch, or you can bring your own image if you're dealing with customization. For this example, we kept it a little simple. We took one of our 1P algorithms, XGBoost, which is a built-in algorithm SageMaker supports. And I pretty much just grabbed a data set that we have in the public AWS samples um, for the Abalone data set, very popular. You might have already run into it. It's just a simple regression problem. All I'm doing here is setting up my clients, which will be interacting with, um, with SageMaker to be able to get our serverless inference endpoint up and running and also to conduct training. So. If I walk through this, the first step is not really related to SageMaker inference at all. It's model training in specific. All I'm doing here is grabbing that image URI that we were talking about. So this is retrieving that XGBoost container or image that we were working with for this example. So this could be scikit-learn, TensorFlow, or PyTorch, or it could be a custom image that you're also working with here. But since SageMaker supports that out of the box, we kind of abstract out the container building or work or maintenance that you have to do. Here, I'm just setting my hyperparameters for training. I'm iterating through all that training. And then once this is completed, I have this model artifact right here, right? And this is that model data that I'm talking about. So this tarball right here will contain that train model artifact. And that'll be the one of the two pieces that we need, right? For SageMaker inference to create the endpoint that we talked about, an image, and then also your model data. So we have both of them completed after training. And a new feature with SageMaker service inference that came with GA was, um, model registry and what model registry is where you can catalog and version your models machine learning is iterative it's very rare not very rare. it's not likely that you're ever going to have just one or two models that you've trained on just once that you're going to be bringing to production you only have to iterate numerous times right there might be numerous hyperparameters that you might be tuning there might even be different models that you're tuning for your specific use case so we added model registry support for serverless inference and in model registry you can create model package groups essentially that have like associated models with a set of hyperparameters maybe, or a set of um, like different, it's just a way to track and catalog your models essentially. And what we're doing here is, and I've created all this existing ahead of time is, we're creating a model package group and I'm associating that model that I've just trained with that model package group and we're pushing it to the model registry using those Boto3 clients. 
And you can visualize all of this also in the UI that Studio provides. If I go to model registry, you'll notice that I've actually created this model group right here. And if I go to this, if I go through this code, all I'm doing is I'm pushing this image URI, the content type that my format's going to be coming in, and I'm updating it with my model data. And if I go here in the UI, you'll notice that all of this matches with what I have in the code. So right here, if you go to versions, this is the version that was approved and um, I've staged it to create an endpoint. You can no you notice that you notice that the status has reached an approved mode. So you can register and track all your models here. This is just one version because I've only iterated on it once, but say you have multiple, right? You can add it to this model package group and push it to this model registry to visualize on the side. That sounds pretty useful. I got a question. Are there any yeah. limits on the size of the model? Let's say I want to upload a really huge model. <laughs> High um, for, for kind of like a point of yeah. reference, what is considered a really huge model <laughs> so, in this context, a, Nathan? A bit more of a, that's a bit more of a general question, but I'd say the way is um you're probably not going to run into limits. Mm -hmm. With SageMaker itself, we've dealt with heavy, heavy NLP and computer vision models and lots of different ensemble models as well when you stack them. It's highly unlikely you run into it, but the cool part is when you're talking about model size with serverless, you can pick a memory option um, along with um, your max concurrency. And that memory option essentially accounts for your model size. So for example, if you have a two GB model, mm -hmm. you can select memory size to be two GB for your serverless endpoint. And then that'll account for that to a certain extent, right? So, and we'll go to that part of the code to kind of show that part, but generally mapping the memory size and making sure whether it's a compute instance or a serverless endpoint, you want to make sure your memory can account for the size of the model. And generally with the host of instance options and even the memory size limits that serverless inference has, it's very hard to kind of break through that. But if you do have a use case for that, I'd love to see it and see if we can work on nice. it. Nice. Cool. So here, once again, just registering the model, everything that you're seeing here is what we're doing in code essentially. And then we get to deployment and this stays consistent for any inference option, async, real time, or serverless. There's three steps generally within SageMaker endpoint creation. There's mo SageMaker model creation, SageMaker endpoint config creation, and then the actual endpoint itself. So the model creation is kind of creating like the boilerplate bare bones, and you're just providing your image URI or your container that you're dealing with. Here, I'm just passing in my model package ARN for the model registry, because that points to my container that I'm working with. And what this does underneath the hood is, you can track all of this in the SageMaker console as well. You'll notice there's a model entity that's been created here and a corresponding endpoint config and endpoint. So it's like this chain that happens um, for any inference creation that you're working with with SageMaker. Model creation is the first step you specify that. And the endpoint config creation is really where the magic happens. And um, with this, this is where you specify to your to SageMaker itself, hey, I'm either working with real time, serverless or async. And if you notice in this production variance parameter right here, I'm providing a serverless config that pretty much um, dictates memory size and max concurrency. Right now, the limits for max concurrency are one to 200. And then memory size, you can go all the way up to six GB as we were talking about. So ideally- Okay, I, 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 see, I see where the limit comes in there. So I'm not necessarily gonna be running, you know, GPT-3, which is like 350 gigabytes. Uh, inside yes. of the serverless inferencing, but I can run mm -hmm. anything that's up to six gigabytes uh, in size uh, mm -hmm. for my model. Definitely, and these are also soft limits. So whenever there's a use case that needs to be really increased, oh, nice. you can always consider it on the back end, right? So it's always something that can be changed to. Okay, so if I do have an even larger model, like a language processing mm -hmm. model or something, and I want to run it, reach out to the team and ask for for a limit increase there. Yep, definitely. Nice. You could ask for a limit increase, we could evaluate, and then most of the time it should go through. Nice. So, um, yeah, these are the two parameters, essentially, that are all the magic for serverless inference. You're just providing your memory size, which, like I said, ideally you want to match up at least to the minimum size that your model would be, and then max concurrencies your concurrent limitations. So um, just the two parameters to consider, and this creates an endpoint config, which you'll notice here as well, right here. If you notice, this is the endpoint config and it contains those two details right here. So you see that memory size and max concurrency. If you don't even want to play with code, you can actually create this just in the console itself. So now if I go, this is the actual endpoint creation step and we'll be able to notice this in the UI as well. If you notice right here, I'm creating that endpoint and 
um, that will iterate. And when we come here, we see this existing endpoint right here, right? You could notice the endpoint config that it's associated with and what we're dealing with. And more importantly, for any invocation metrics, you can track everything here um, within CloudWatch itself, just like real-time inference. The metrics vary a little from real-time because obviously it's a, a few different parameters. But if you click at the invocation metrics, you'll you'll be able to see that I've invoked this in the past hour. And that, that's what I'm dealing with. So if I click invocations, you'll notice that the endpoint is getting invoked, right? And then you can track other stuff like model and overhead latency, Com some of the common metrics you might have already seen with real-time inference. Now, with these metrics that you had there, are those uh, already created as you create this, or um, do you have to go in and create your custom metrics through CloudWatch? No, so these are automatically created by SageMaker. Awesome. Yep. So then what you could do is if I come back here, here's a sample invoke. Let's just run through that. You'll notice that it's getting invoked. And this is the same exact API call as a real-time endpoint or an async endpoint. So um, not any difference, as you can see, not much difference in the code. If you have an existing container, slash image URI or like model data, then it's very easy to port it over from real time to serverless or serverless to real time and back. So there's great flexibility in the offering. And um, yeah, I'll hand it back to you two and Richard to just bring all this to a close. So it sounds like according to what you mentioned, the, the versatility and being able to go from serverless to, you said real time? Yeah. And real time to serverless. Um, so if you have a use case that you believe is very uh, useful for the the serverless functionality of it, uh, but then you're finding that with the you mentioned uh, cold starts, and then just like the spin up time that you need to take that over to the real time uh, functionality of SageMaker, you can easily do that, and then vice versa. If you find that you have real time stood up, and it's like okay, this is more appropriate for something that doesn't need to be running all the time, you can yeah. go ahead and send it over to the serverless inference. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think the really cool part is that you don't have to make any changes to the container. Um, you can deploy the same container um, on both serverless and real time. So today, if your traffic is intermittent, you deploy on serverless. Tomorrow, it becomes more stable. You just need to update the endpoint. So today, we do um, do support update endpoint feature from serverless to real time, but not vice versa. Uh, but it's pre still pretty simple for customers. They just need to create a new endpoint config, uh, specify the serverless uh, um, inputs and then deploy on serverless if they want to move back from real time to serverless. But still, with both models, there's a lot of things I don't have to think about. I didn't see I didn't see anywhere where I was like choosing a GPU generation and like choosing an EC2 instance type and then trying to figure out you know how many models or copies of my model can I run on a particular instance type. And those are all problems that I've seen you know from the other side, folks who weren't using SageMaker. You know, they they have to worry about like things like how do I get that big model down onto my instance? How do I how do I choose the right instance type that will fit like three copies of my model at the same time? And, and with all that, I don't have to think about that anymore with the the serverless inferencing. <laughs> yeah. Well, very nice. I'm very excited to uh, hear more uh, about this uh, as even more customers adopt it and and what their their use cases and benefits uh, are as things go on. Um, is there anywhere that folks should go to, you know, learn about a demo or documentation to find out how they can get started? Yep. So um, you can find this exact example, the SageMaker examples repo, the public okay. repo. And if you go to the serverless inference um, branch, you'll see this example. And then if you have any cool examples yourself, it's a public repository. So you can add it there. And if you do get GPT, GPT-3 working on there, feel free. <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be awesome. Well, uh, we will drop that link into the chat uh, for all y'all uh, viewers, so you can click on that. Please go check it out. Please try out the uh, serverless inferencing and uh, let the team know uh, how it worked for you. Thank you very much for uh, for joining us today. It was a pleasure talking uh, as always, and uh, we'll uh, talk more about serverless uh, machine learning in the future as well. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the the insightful information too. That's uh... It's great to learn about as well. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. All right. Take care.